Hey, everybody, we are back and welcome to Grow Live with Katie with Homestead Gardens and Homestead Brooklyn. Hey, Summer, how are you? I'm very well. How are you doing? I am great. We have a lot of homesteads working today. I know, I know. It gets a little confusing, but, and I'm at my own, my new homestead. <laughs> I know, I cannot wait to hear all about it. So um, we've chatted a lot with Summer Rain Oaks of Homestead Brooklyn, and you've been to Homestead, haven't you? Or did that yes. get cut off in the pandemic? Yeah, you Oh, no, there. no, no. Yeah, it was pre-pandemic days, like the good old days, you know? Yes, back when, it was probably part of your- um, Book tour. Book, what'd you call it? Your pub crawl. Plant shop pub crawl. Yes, yeah. Plant shop pub crawl. I love that. That was so fun. So you guys all at Homestead know Summer very, very well, but she has had a lot of changes in her life very recently. And of course, over the pandemic, you did a lot to support plant people throughout the pandemic. Um, one of the things that I think about you, when I think about your channels, I think about you as a connector of people to plants, but also to each other. You know, one of the things we we often come to Summer, Garden Media Group puts on a trends report. We also, also often turn to Summer and ask her what's happening out there. And one of the big things she identified, this is two years ago, mm -hmm. was that community, that plant community that was really, you know, coming together to share their love of plants, but also connect with each other. You had people, one of your famous stories was meet and fall in love at some of your plant spots. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I mean, I think that, when people are looking for plants, a lot of times they are looking for community. And I think even homestead gardens and a lot of garden centers out there act as a community connector as well. Um, you know, going there for workshops. I mean, first of all, I, I miss going to homestead gardens because I really love they had their goats and everything, everything out there. It was like a little mini farm, um, which is wonderful. So, you know, they're kind of taking, you know, the next step. It's not just like a place where you go and shop and you get your plants. It's a place where you could connect and, um, and grow together, really, you know, every pun intended. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that there was a lot of trends that were coming out that we were discussing. You know, the community was obviously a big aspect of it. I think affinity groups within the community was, you know, something that, you know, I, we really saw kind of coming to the fore. Um, people who, you know, say, oh, I found my love with plants, but I also have people who maybe act like me or look like me or think like me a little bit more within the plant community. And I think that um, that, that kind of friendly vibe has has permeated for, you know, for, until now and then, and, and even more so. And I've been meeting a lot more people who I have bumped into at garden centers who say, I just got into plants during the pandemic. So I think that the, the trend of gardening has been increasing dramatically. And then with the pandemic, um, you know, if there's a silver lining in anything, it's, it's people have found their way to plants even more. That is so true. And we've been seeing that at Homestead, particularly with houseplants. And we should say yesterday was National Houseplant Appreciation Day. Although people like you and I, we celebrate it all year round and at Homestead Gardens. So I have to quickly, Summer, since you can't get to Homestead, if you guys are just looking, let me show you some pictures of what it looks like right now. They're so tiny. I'm going to oh. hide myself and check you through these because you guys, Homestead has so many houseplants right now. We're going to learn from That's summer. Nice. I'm like looking about, at them all. Yeah, ready? <laughs> I'm going to hide myself. You can't hear me when I hide myself. So okay. um, I'm going to check through them real fast. Summer, if you want to tell us what you see that you love, go for it. But hold on. Well, it's it's such a tiny photo. I mean, it looks like they have crotons there. Oh, some uh, Marantaceae, some uh, Japortias. I mean, they have tons of Marantaceae. Uh, it looks like they have some philodendron syngoniums. They have cryptanthus, which is the earth stars, which are really neat. It's kind of in the bromeliad family with some bromeliads in the back. Uh, those are looking good. And they have some very large dracaena trees. <laughs> larger than the ones that we get in New York. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So I had to show that because when they sent that to me, I thought, what an urban oasis. You know, I mean, hopefully Gardens is outside of Baltimore, but it is just, that's what you mentioned it. Like that's what our, our plant shops do for us. Our local garden mm -hmm. centers at Homestead Gardens will bring us that breath of fresh air when we walk in and that community. So um, anyway, we're here to talk with Summer about, you have a book, how to make a plant love you. So Summer's gonna help us. There are a lot of new plant parents out there, like Summer said, people who came to the hobby just in the last year and we welcome you. And Summer, you can check out her channels. I know we'll post them in the comments. Check out all of your channels um, and learn about how to make plants love you. And there's a lot of different 
different ways to do that. But one of the things we want to do at Homestead Gardens is give away one of Summer's books. I didn't tell you this, Summer. Surprise. Um, oh, and maybe if you haven't signed it, we'll see about how the logistics of that. I don't know if you yeah. have any where you are. Um, but the way that you enter is that you tell us one of your favorite plants in the comments. And so let us know what you love. And you can enter throughout this whole, we'll, we'll mention it again towards the end. That's the only way you enter. And we'll draw a winner at random at the end of the of the presentation. People are going to spew, when you say your favorite plant, people are just going to spew like, a, a, they're, they're never going to be able to pick their favorite. <laughs> I know. <laughs> be like That's multiple okay. votes. You can enter many times. Just tell us your favorite plant. So, and, and we got a lot of people who are telling us where they're tuning in from. We got a lot of people from Maryland, of course, and Delaware. Um, so why don't you tell us where you are, Summer? Tell us about what's happening in your life right now. Well, I think the most exciting thing for me is that um, for two years, my friends and I, two of my friends and I have been looking for a property upstate. And this was obviously pre-pandemic. Once the pandemic hit, it was a little bit uh, crazy. <laughs> but the good news is that we actually found something. And this really is, I, I mean, honestly, I'm beside myself. I'm, I'm so excited to have a, a, a piece of land that we could actually steward. And this hopefully will ex expand my repertoire. I mean, I, I grew up doing uh, more like mine reclamation, landscape design, that kind of stuff, and had to move away from it, you know, for in the in Brooklyn. So I will be in Brooklyn still half my time, and I'll be half time up here. Uh, obviously, there's no planting happening in the winter months here. Uh, it's like it's like a winter wonderland out here. Yeah, but there's snow in the ground. Yes, there's snow on the ground, there's frost in the trees. So I think that's what makes it look like so beautiful. But, you know, come the growing season, which is in May, uh, for us, then uh, I think we'll be able to expand that repertoire. So plant one on me on YouTube will continue. I know a lot of folks know that channel. And we're going to be launching a new channel. It's actually up already, but we don't have any videos up. But we should launch it next month. It's called Flock Finger Lakes. And so we're in the Finger Lakes of New York, very beautiful. And in an area that is um, called the Emerald Necklace, because it's known for the state parks and national parks and private lands um, in a kind of a, a necklace shape around uh, the city of Ithaca. And so we're kind of in that Emerald Necklace, which is really lovely because when you meet people, like we know in the plant community, when you meet people and you're with people who kind of you know think a little bit more like you and care about the world and care about the environment, it, uh, it, it makes you feel like you're in a community more. So that's, um, that's exciting for us. Oh my God, congratulations. That's so exciting. Thank my in-laws, I told you, are from Ithaca and it is such yeah. a cool part of the world. Um, if you guys know, if you've been there, you know there's tons of natural gorges and or waterfalls, if you don't know what that means. I yeah. didn't know at first, I'm like gorges, but you went to Cornell, so you're yeah. very familiar with the area. Yeah, that's what that's why I tried to convince my friends to come up here and the topography and the geology is just amazing. And folks will get to know it a lot more through the channel. I'll tell you that because there's just a lot of interesting things happening up here, a lot of interesting folks. Um, and a really great mindset to sit some folks out here. I'm not saying that everybody thinks alike. That's not true. But um, but there's there's a lot going on, and I think the university helps with that, of course, because there's a lot of like research uh, happening here. And so hopefully we'll incorporate that and then share it with uh, with people and continue to to educate and and entertain. I hope because uh, I think sometimes education can be entertainment. And, uh, and allow us to actually better ourselves and better our lives. And so that's what I hope to do with like, you know, with Plant One On Me, my books, and hopefully this new, <laughs> this new, uh, this new channel. I love it. Well, we posted a link to it so you guys can um, check out the website, follow the YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel and follow along. I think it's a natural progress. You you said like you went from Pennsylvania growing outside to indoors. A lot of people start indoors. and mm -hmm. But I do think we've had so many people e either leaving the cities temporary or tempor temporarily or permanently. And now they're doing the transition like you. They're starting to have a little plot of land outside, a little container to grow in, or maybe a little piece of yard, like ground to gardening. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this comes at such a perfect time, Summer, that people are going to be transitioning just like you are from indoor. You'll keep your indoor passion, I know. Keep your yeah. apartment in <laughs> Brooklyn. But, um, and transition to outdoor and learn how to cultivate a little plot of land. So that's awesome. We're so excited. Um, and we've got some people turning in from Texas. So I love it. Thank you, everybody, oh, hey, for tuning in. Um, this is Summer Rain Oaks from Homestead, Brooklyn, and Flock 
flocking finger lakes flock finger lakes yeah flock, flock finger, finger lakes. lakes yeah yeah it looks like flock thingy flock fing. Flocking. <laughs> flock yeah, finger flocking. lakes yeah and then uh in maryland forsythias are a favorite of mine as well everybody's sharing their their favorite plants and flowers and stuff like that so I, I love forsythias. For, I had forsythia bushes growing up in my my house in Pennsylvania. My mom used to keep them and clip them, and uh, they were they were favorites. They like like look like yellow fireworks everywhere. Oh my god! Well, I reminded my six year old the other day. She since forgot it, but I she asked me what her first flower she ever could say was, and mm -hmm. I told her forsythia, and she's uh, like, "What?" I mean, that's a hard one. That's a hard one to say. <laughs> well, you know, the kids have the lisp anyway, so yeah, they, just, they yeah. got it. And um, you're right, I love those as well. So today we're talking house plants, though. You know, we, summer has so much going on. You can find her on our channels for plant one on me or some of my favorite. You also did house tours. Um, which yes. are probably stopped during the pandemic. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm, I want to try to start those back up, but I just don't know how people feel about it. So uh, we'll see. I mean, I've been, I just did a field trip um, the other day. We're editing it. So that'll be coming up. I know people like to see the field trips again too, because at least it's, even though you can't get out, you know, maybe you could actually go see plants through the field trip. So we were able to finagle that one, luckily, but um, yeah, the house tour is, have been a little bit on back burner, unfortunately. <laughs> well, you're right, people love, I mean, you know, none of us love sitting in front of our computers all day, mm -hmm. but it's the way that we can access our community right now. And that's what, right. that's what this plant thing is all about, is our community. Yeah. And so that's why Homestead Gardens wanted to bring these chats to you so we could feel like we were all together. Um, so let's talk about houseplants. Let's jump into it and talk sure. really about the premise of your book. Why don't you tell us what, I think I get it, how to make a plant love you, but tell us a little bit about what, what that means and then we'll jump yeah. into a few tips that you have for people on on how you know they can start by choosing a plant. Yeah. Well, the the book How to Make a Plant Love You, it was it, the subtitle is Cultivate Green Space in Your Home and Heart. And I took green space not to be so literally, but you know, cultivate a, like a space where not only where you could have plants, but also a space in your heart and your spirit and your mind. So it's a little bit more of a philosophical journey. And I and I do talk about kind of you know, coming from the country and being in the city and then where that restricts you, you know, in your life and, and what you start to recognize when you are not in nature any longer and how you could actually bring that indoors with you and have that as a way to remind you to get outdoors and to, to remind you what not only maybe in some ways that we feel like we've lost, but maybe if we never had it, you know, to begin with, but there's something deep down in our DNA that really connects us to the environment and how to make a plant love you kind of brings us back there. And, you know, I, I obviously I did most of the writing with the book, but again, I opened it up to the community to share what plants have given them, like just members of the community. What, what have plants brought you? And, you know, people shared some things that were really emotional for them. Everything from, remembering a loved one all the way to, um, you know, having some type of loss in, in one's life or dealing with anxiety, which I think a lot of us actually have being cooped up, uh, you know, might as well just say it, you know, that that's the, that's the type of stuff. So developing something where you feel like you have a little bit of control of, I think is always nice. Being able to see something grow um, understanding that sometimes you do lose something and, and being able to accept that. So I think plants could actually teach us a lot. And that's really what the book is about. And of course, I throw some tips in there and everything along those lines. But how to make a plant love you is really kind of a play on wor words in the sense where it's like, well, you know, we have to ask what our plants need from us in order for them to actually love us. And, and hopefully, when people read the book, they actually get a lot more um, out of the book than just like a few tips and stuff like that. So yeah, so that's a little bit more of what the book is about. That's great. Thank you. And I know I do love it. When I first got it, it was like, look, you know, I opened it. It was so different than a lot of the other books because it is a lot of the other books feature a plant and then list how to care for it. And that's important yeah. too. Um, although we should say that every plant is different. You know, it's like a person. We had your friend Hilton Carter on last week, Summer. Yeah. And he um, he says hello, by the way. He said he was going to crash our party. But um, he reminded us that Plants are like people. So when you put yeah. one fiddly fig in my home, my conditions are so different than when it goes to Summer's home. So it, it's it's yeah. very much 
dependent on the plant and your condition. So making sure, like Summer said, not only is your home the right place, but you're coming at it with the right heart too. And you're yeah. ready to care for plants. Yeah. And I actually was just on my field trip and we had an interesting conversation with the head gardener. Now they're in a greenhouse, right? But he said, you know, I know a lot of the, you know, people are looking for quick tips, you know, so for instance, the cacti and succulent, we started succulents, we started talking about and he said, you know, a lot of people say don't water your cacti in the winter. And that's even something I said, you know, indoors, in many cases, I don't water my cacti until probably February, this last year, it was February, because spring came a little early. But typically, it's up until March. But he said in a greenhouse, with all that light coming in, they have to water throughout winter. And of course, if you have some of those succulents and cacti and you're in California or Arizona and you're growing those plants in your landscape, of course they're gonna get rained on if it rains. So, you know, there's all the certain, th certain things that you can't necessarily just, um, you know, have a, have a little list and say, okay, this is the only thing I need to do with this. No, learning how to observe is, is key and, um, and in, uh, in the book, and also in my houseplant masterclass, there's exercises to help really people uh, teach people how to observe. And it's such a soft skill. It's not necessarily something that's a hard skill that you could just, you know, two plus two is four. Um, so, you know, it's very nuanced. And I, I always feel like I could always improve my observation skills. There's always something to improve on there. So there's always something to work towards. And, uh, and, and that's, that's an important thing. Case in point, moved some plants in this new place and i have a snake plant that we got very beautiful all of a sudden it started to get brown browning on one side just like really quirky brown and i was like what what is happening and i knew i started to eliminate things you know it's it does it's not circular in nature so it's probably not bacterial or fungal um you know we've been watering it just just the same you know a little bit more now but this light that comes through is really intense it's almost like greenhouse conditions it was not accustomed to that and since it was starting to brown on one side i was like oh okay in this is probably sun damage even though it's a snake plant which is you know a succulent plant that should be able to handle it but it hasn't it hasn't had that kind of light in probably its life so uh you know those are things to kind of observe that would be a little out of the ordinary but you wouldn't know unless it was in the context of what your of your environment you know what i'm saying yeah and i love that because i was going to ask you how i mean i know you have a whole like you said it is a very nuanced thing and also it is it's based on variety plant species and location but if there are some things you could check off to help us observe but i love how you just listed those so can you rule out pests and diseases um can you rule out some watering which as we both know and you guys probably all out there know that is the number one reason for overwatering too much love people probably kill their plants um, but i love the, the, the idea of the sun and coming in on one side are there right. any other you know as you said listed through those are there other things that people should take a look at like if they just are bringing a new plant home oftentimes there can be some issues in that first couple of months well i think a lot of uh, a lot of folks um you know get i mean maybe i'll answer that question uh, in a peripheral because one of the things that i think of is you know when when plants start to uh feel, look like they're not getting enough water or they're drooping or they're uh, turning wrinkly i'm a really big advocate in always checking the roots of plants so if if you see something that's that's uh you know a little droopy wrinkled puckered that type of stuff something is not working properly like water is most likely not getting to the plant or the tips of the plant leaves and there could be some potential root damage there sometimes when i think my my plant is unwatered it's it happens to be like mealy bugs and sometimes even though they're like white cottony insects they somehow could you know avoid detection for uh quite some time so occasionally you want to you know just say okay is it a pest no it's not sucking the juices out okay because typically when you see something drooping whether it's like a photonia or a spathophyllum or whatever it is you want to water it but that you could actually invite root rot and damage if the roots are not okay to begin with so i'm a big advocate no matter what season to kind of pull your plant out and check the roots and see if they're too dry if they're too mushy because certain things can happen where if you have like more of a peaty mix, for instance, and you're not watering your plant regularly, like if you have a succulent or cacti, it could get uh, really dry. And then when you water it, 
it doesn't penetrate the soil anymore because it dried out and it will beat up and go down the edges and then the roots will start to dry out and then die back. Or you have a situation where you are watering it too much, it's too wet and then there's a lot of maybe bacterial or fungal rot happening within the soil and, uh, and then that could actually hurt the plant. So I'm a big advocate of like pulling the plant out, checking the roots, uh, and that's sometimes what you have to do with your sometimes cacti and succulents anyway, you know, because some plants like our echeverias and things like that, they don't look as cute as when we first bought them, right? They get Most stalks. Of the they time have, they don't. Yes. Yeah. They get stalks, you know, sedum is another one that, that you could get like long stalks off of. And it's not even that they're etiolating, like, which means that they're stretching out. Oftentimes it just is how they grow. Mm. Um, aloe. And uh, like there's certain aloes that get big, big stems and like dried skirts. I'm really into aloes right now. So like, you know, they get these dried skirts and they don't look so pretty, but that for them in nature is an ecological advantage because it actually helps preserve the nice uh, uh, succulent leaves that maybe animals will want to eat or mm -hmm. dig into. So, you know, there's cer certain things that may not look as aesthetically pleasing indoors. And I know that there's with plants, there's always this benefit of like aesthetics and nature. <laughs> right. So, yeah. It's the Instagram versus reality type of idea where, yes, your plants don't always have to look 100% great all the time. Um, yeah. But I love your, you know, your tips of observation. Number one thing of how to make a plant love you is to observe your plants. Pay attention to them. They are living things in your home. And most likely you can help them, you know, whether it be a root issue and there's bugs or pests or water, or whatever it is, you can help them live their best life. Yeah. And I also think that we're in our, we're in the winter months right now. And there's a lot of plants of mine and probably of yours that go dormant. Mm -hmm. And again, this goes back to, oh, it doesn't look as aesthetically pleasing, but somebody had mentioned one of their favorite plants is amaryllis. Well, you, you know that amaryllis are, are not always in bloom all the time. You know, they need a, a, a rest period. And I have a lot of interesting tropical bulbs that, um, unless you have South African bulbs, they're, you know, they're, they're in bloom now, amaryllis might be in bloom now, but uh, but sometimes they're not in bloom and they have no green parts either. And, you know, those are things that you just don't want to chuck. You, you, you might have to keep them aside or in a, you know, cool, dry, dark place. And, uh, and there's certain plants like my begonias all needed clipping back. You know, they were so full and beautiful in, uh, you know, the springtime or even last summer. And now they're all starting to grow back because I'd clipped them. And it seems a little harsh and I should probably do way more pruning and primping of my plants, but my begonias, I all had to cut them back and they don't look so pretty now. They don't look as full, but it's something that, you know, I encourage people to do, especially even, even if it's like for a season that they don't look uh, as, yeah. as prime as they could. Right. So we have a couple of questions. You guys shoot us your questions. We have some are here to answer them. So I want to start with Nick. Um, Nick seems to be a, plant lover and a Homestead Brooklyn big time fan. So first thing, mm -hmm. he didn't really ask a question, but he mentioned that he loves snake plants and that someone in his family got his mom's collection. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about the pups and maybe if he could continue the life of that collection by by separating them and maybe talk him through a little bit of how to do that, because I feel like that is something that could help him get a piece of his mom's collection. Yeah, well, I think um, snake plants are really interesting because there's so many different cultivars out there. And this is a great example. I think this is a, a gold, uh, it might be called a gold flame. So you see it has it. this kind of coloration with um, with like yellows and greens. If you actually took a cutting of this, it the new growth wouldn't stay that same color. So I think if in order to get part of the, the collection, you know, the, the snake plant will spread by a rhizome. So we have like this little guy coming off to the side. So if you're able to, again, pull this out and have a nice sharp cut down so you could take this little uh, offset off, then you're going to get, and you have, and as long as you have a piece of that rhizome, it's going to continue to, to carry on this coloration. And, um, and that's just because uh, you need some of the meristem or the growing area and, and snake plants are the type of uh, plant that need that. Cause so even though you can take a cutting from the leaf, uh, yeah, it, 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 will, it will revert back to its ordinary color, which is 
typically probably green. Now there are some that actually, uh, you know, are a little bit more like stoloniferous. And so they'll have this like long stem, like a rhizome, um, it, it's just above ground and will do another offset that way. I'm thinking of like, I'm trying to think of the, since all snake plants have turned to Dracaena now, right. but uh, you know, sans, it was, I think it's formerly Sansevieria gr gracilis. You know, that is one that has, or you know, there's probably one called Stolonifera or something. They have like these stolons that you could easily clip off and you'll see they'll, they'll, stick, they'll stick their little stem right back down into the, uh, into the soil and start to propagate that way. But if you are gonna take, prop, like if you're gonna propagate snake plants, I would say, make sure you get part of that uh, as, as close to the rhizome and some of that rhizome as possible in order to maintain that coloration. And snake plants are really giving. They, they might be slow growers if you have them growing in like the lowest light of the area of your house, but um, they should be able to, case in point, take a little bit more sun, but you probably have to, if they hadn't had that sun, like my snake plant I said in the beginning, you should probably, you know, introduce it to that kind of light slowly and gradually. So up the light as much as possible because one bad burn, it only takes about 15 minutes. And I'm not just talking about ourselves in the sun. It only takes about 15 minutes for a plant to actually uh, damage its chlorophyll and, uh, and get a, a bad burn from the sun. And once the chlorophyll is damaged, you know, the plant, you're not going to get that, that back. There's nothing to, to repair that. So, uh, so yeah, so snake plants, you know, offsets, making sure you have the rhizome, even though you could actually take uh, cuttings of the leaf. And, and I have a whole propagation video on snake plants that are up, but I've done propagation through soil. I've done it through uh, LECA. I've done it through just regular water. And it, every single one, I mean, it wasn't really a, you know, scientific study or anything like that, but I was surprised when I pulled everything out um, that it, it rooted all very well. Yeah, they do. They take a lot. They keep on kicking. And I know they are the, the favorite of the low light plants, but yeah. um, I think it's important to realize what low light, maybe you could help people understand. Um, Carrie, we'll get to your question about fiddle leaf figs in a minute, but help people understand low light doesn't mean no light. There's no plant that can live in the dark, maybe mushrooms actually, but. Um, well, they're and, not a plant though. They're a oh, fungus. Oh, great, fungus. <laughs> so, so yeah, no plant in the dark. Moss, so moss, is a little, moss is a little bit more forgiving when it comes to, obviously it's a non-vascular plant, but. Uh, but I, I have uh, moss and terrariums and they're in fairly uh, very low light conditions. But, um, but you think about that, you go outside in nature and you see where right. in the forest floor, it's in a cool, damp, yeah. you know, dark place is moss and, uh, and they need that, that water and they're, they're non-vascular. So they, they, are, they, they can't be in like really intense, uh, intense light. There are some mosses that actually can be, there's some desert mosses out there, but they have different strategies in order to be able to collect like mist and stuff like that. And that hmm. plants, once you get into them, like there's, there's, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, but sorry, what was your question? Again? Low light, helping people understand. Oh, low light, yeah. And you're welcome, Nick. He, Nick was very appreciative about that. So good. Oh, good. Lots of yeah, people I'm sure want to know about that. And maybe Courtney, you can find Summer's video about um, propagating. If you can't, we'll post it later. But yeah. low light, what does that even mean? Well, you know, so when we think about low light in our door, in, indoors, it's so different from like, shade to partial shade outdoors, you know? So um, low light indoors is really extremely low light. It would be lower than the shade or partial shade outdoors. That's always something that I, you know, always really think of. So um, for, for plants that it's usually, they say they're low light tolerant. You never see like low light loving. This plant's a low light lover. No, it's low light tolerant. And it's tolerant for probably a certain period of time, right? Snake plants, low light tolerant, but you know, they, they will chug along, but oftentimes you'll start to see that they'll, they'll start to droop their leaves. And a typical thing when, when plants are trying to get more light and there's not, there's no direction of light coming in because it's just ambient light, they'll start to pull their leaves down almost mm -hmm. like uh, parallel to the ground because they're trying to collect as many rays as possible wherever those rays might be. There's probably no rays because it's just ambient light, right? So when you have a plant that is 
uh, you know, has a directional light maybe coming from above like a skylight, they're going to stick their, stick their, their uh, little fronds up in the air and they're going to be like, okay, you know, because maybe they'll even try to reduce the light if it's too intense. And so you'll, you'll have less surface area to the, um, uh, to the light, right? So they're trying to create as much surface area as possible. So when your, your plants start to lay out, like your dog lays on your bed or something along those lines, it's trying to take up as much surface area as possible in order to get as much light. So um, plants that are more low light tolerant are ones that when I think of are ones that are usually on the forest floor. So, but it doesn't mean that if you don't give them a little bit more light, they actually could grow better and stronger and healthier because most of the time they can. It's just that they've carved out that niche for themselves. Um, so, you know, it, it, and light dissipates really quickly. So even if I have like a south facing window and I'm like right up against the window, that light is intense. But even if I'm like three, four, five feet back, that could already be lower light. Mm -hmm. And it depends on how uh, how deep the light, you know, travels into. But Soltech Solutions Light, it's something that I have. I, I really like that. Uh, I really like that light. It's a nice grow light. Um, when it's right up at the light, uh, that's like almost full sun. So it's, uh, I don't know, it's, was it, is it in foot candles, it might be like 5,000. I'm not sure. And then it, and then as you get about two feet away, you're already at like medium light. And if you get lower than two feet, you're already at low light. So that just really gives you a sense of like how quickly light will actually dissipate mm -hmm. um, from a single so light source. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so when I think about low light tolerant, I think about oh god, I want to identify plants that actually grow on the forest floor. And some of the ones that I think have been the, the strongest for me are aglionemas. Um, not all aglionemas, but some of the aglionemas. Uh, the ones that are more cultivars that are like pink and reds and everything they need, I, I feel like they need a little stronger light. And then um, pelionias they're called, or procris repens, they're, that's their new genus. Really underserved houseplant, those are really great. Uh, and also my, my ZZ plants, again, I have ZZ plants that don't grow as quickly as ones that I have towards a window light, right. but the ones in the interior are strong enough, but they do have this kind of like arching shape where they're trying to get as much light as possible. So we had a ton of questions on the last chat about grow light. So, and Hilton was like, well, whatever they have at Homestead. So I wouldn't mention if, if you guys have questions, Summer mentioned Soltech Solutions, but Homestead has a great department that can help you picking out the right light for your space. Because I know a lot of us don't have, you look like you've got beautiful lighting in that new place. I mean, look yeah. at all those windows. But I know, and, there, I, and, and such a lack of plants. <laughs> uh, like here, we, we, haven't, we haven't really, you know, gotten, because there's gonna be renovations here. And one of the things is you don't want to stress yourself out. People love plants. We love plants. The only time that I felt like I was really stressed with my plants, and I'm just going to say this, is when I had construction in my house yeah, and I had I to move that. all the plants away. So just just be mindful. It's not about how many plants you have. It you know, and it even you have different life stages. You know, if I'm in between moving, I might just decide that I have to like you know reduce my my plant collection. Or you know, part of the reason why I got into aloes. Was I'm like I want some more resilient plants so that I can be freely moving back and forth a little bit more. And mm -hmm. uh, and aloes, uh, I got I got really into aloes and started getting sucked into the the world of aloes a bit more. And I find that they're, they're extremely resilient plants and they're not like they're not super needy. So <laughs> I love that. And that's a lot of us. I guess we're all home now, but we'll go back to a time when we're not. And it's, it's a little, we need more of those resilient plants that we can't look helicopter parent as much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes. So Meredy Weir is asking, what's the name of the grow, grow, grow lights and soul S O L tech, right? Yeah. Soul tech, um, S O L T E C H soul tech solutions. And and actually, this is relevant. If if people want fifteen percent off, there it's ho it's Homestead twenty twenty one. And then I'm sure Homestead Gardens also has like GE grow lights. Um, there's a lot of grow lights on the market now that are great. There's bulbs now that you could just like put into a regular lighting fixture um, with like an E twenty six like uh, base and everything. And they're they're a little bit beefier, so you you have to make sure that your uh, lampshade or whatever can can yeah. host it, and they're 
also a little bit heavier. Some of them, not all of them. Some of them are a little bit heavier. They can be up to a pound, if you can oh. imagine, a pound light. So you, if you have one of those lighting fixtures that you know stands on your desk, if it's the least bit loose, it's going to go straight down. Oh. So, so yeah. So they're usually the 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 bulb grow lights right now are usually between I would say like ten and sixteen ounces. So they are a little bit meatier, but great light. And you'll want to pay attention to the Kelvin. The Kelvin is not something that we really commit to memory, but the Kelvin is the color temperature of the light, right? So if you want daylight balanced light, then you're probably going towards more 5,000, 5,500 Kelvin. So that's like that white light, like if the sun was coming in and not during golden hour, but if like this, the bright light sun during noon, noonday sun was coming in, that would be that kind of like white light. Now in your home, again, it goes back to that kind of aesthetics, you know, feel, right? What do you, what makes, where, where is that light? Is it next to your bed? You know, you, then you probably won't want a daylight balance thing right there, especially if you're spending a lot of time in your bedroom, or you're reading books and stuff. You want to go with a lo something lower on the Kelvin scale. So the way that I think about it is that candlelight is more like a thousand and fifteen hundred Kelvin. So it has that like moody light. Mm -hmm. and, and then as you get up from there, it's a little less yellowish orange and it gets a little less moodier. So uh, if you want something that's, you know, in your living room, uh, then you want to look at the Kelvin scale. And it, there's all these, you know, things that when you look on the back of the light, we don't usually pay attention to. But uh, but you should pay attention to it depending on where you're going to have it in your room so that you don't create this like stark contrast where it looks like you're walking into a bunch of fluorescence and you feel like you're in your office again you know, abducted by aliens or something and yeah. next week we're going to have daryl chang on and we're going to talk all about lights that's all Great. we're going to talk about it's one so, of his so i don't need I, I don't need i don't need to talk about it all then <laughs> no you can't and I mean, people are so interested in it and i think that just yeah. goes to show that first of all we live in some dark spaces you know we have i think people are realizing as you said the distance you get from the window it happens really fast that yeah. your plants it's not the the high bright light and that's a People say succulents are easy, and they would be if we had the right light for them. You know exactly, so I, exactly, and it's all about observation too. Because I could be very general, and I am sometimes on my channel where I'm like, know what direction your light faces if you're southwest, east, you know, uh, north or whatever. And but sometimes it's about the angle, the light, you know, that comes in. There's a lot of great apps out there that um, let you see where the angle of the sun and the angle of the sun in April is so different than the angle of the sun in September and where it's actually moving. And, 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 you know, I know in my Southwest w window in Brooklyn, the light, the way that the angle comes in, um, towards the afternoon, it really does kind of stretch into the stretch into the, the house, but it doesn't always do that, you know, in every season. So you just, again, this is where observation comes into play and you could take those things as a uh, helpful direction, but it shouldn't be gospel. Like whatever it is, you could you could use it as a as a you know put that pin in the hat and say oh, okay yeah the blah 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 well you know home, Homestead Brooklyn or whatever said this and but that might not be true and and if you're like obviously facing a building and you have tinted windows like those things are obviously going to have an effect on on your light of course and even sheer shades like the ones you have behind you so there's yeah, a lot of things yeah. that can have an effect on that light that you might not realize so yeah um, Meredy, tune back in i know we're getting to be 40 minutes here which is crazy but i want to get back to carrie's question because i feel like fiddle leaf figs are always a popular plant and they are it can be a nightmare for some people to grow and they're pretty expensive too i mean some of our plants especially these large plants that we want in our home to make that mm -hmm. big splash um what are just some general care tips that you might have for figs? Um, well, one is my my fiddle leaf fig hates being bumped. It's it's one of those things where and, and figs could actually remain very um, com, uh, uh, compact in their their planters. You don't always need to uh, replant them as they're getting. Can you tell quite me that large. now. I just replanted this one when I made. <laughs> well, <laughs> you could. I mean, time, you, you could. Um, yeah. Sure, but they they are used to being a little bit restricted. And uh, and and sometimes when you when you repot them, you could actually slice some of the the roots to help them grow out because you know roots are never good at like they they could girdle themselves if they keep on going around and around in circles, especially in a container. But um, yeah, fiddle leaf figs hate being bumped. So once you find a place for it, 
kind of don't move it, don't rub up against the leaves or anything along those like too much. You know, you could obviously clean the leaves because they are quite large, especially if you're going with the ficus lirata or the fiddle leaf fig. Uh, you will need to dust them from time to time. Um, the other thing too is that like my fiddle leaf fig is, is really close to my southwest window and I always have to pull it away because so, sometimes it doesn't know any better. It'll stick its leaves right up to that window and yeah. it, the chlorophyll will start to damage and degrade over time and then it'll get a little less, it'll get a, like a lot less um, lustrous, if you will. So, uh, and then, you know, there, there aren't too many things that affect a fiddle leaf fig, but there, you can get like spider mites on some of the new growth, um, especially if it's getting like burned from, and it's having some stress from that. Uh, and then the other thing is you could, you could cut your fiddle leaf back if you want. I, I let my fiddle leaf grow. Again, this goes back to the pruning thing. You can, or you don't have to. I let my fiddle leaf go run amok. And then uh, when the construction workers had to come into my house, that's when I had to really cut it back because they kept on bumping into it and a fiddle leaf fig hates getting bumped into. So, uh, so that's something to be really mindful of. And, you know, it is going to be a nutrient hog as it starts to grow. So be sure to actually fertilize your fiddle leaf fig. It will want some fertilization over time, especially if you see it's putting on a lot of new growth. It has those big leaves. It's going to take in some, some nitrogen to keep those leaves looking like really green and, and lush. So that's something to, to, to be mindful of. And um, I tried a fiddle leaf fig in my interior space, um, didn't work. Uh, northeast window, it was great. Southwest window, it was great. But uh, remember how light just drops off really dramatically. If you start kind of moving it away from a light source, then it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge for that, for that fig. Oh my gosh, that was so great. I learned so much. I did not know they do not like to be bumped. I had no oh, idea. No, like, you probably yeah, said anything, they'll, they'll start to brown time. up along the leaves. No, it, it's 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 not a good thing. Also, somebody was asking about the, the pink blue light yeah. that like that influences blooms. So, you know, the the blue and the red lights, the reason why we had blue and red lights to begin with is because that's where, you know, it's it, it affects the chlorophyll A and the chlorophyll the B, which are the two types of chlorophyll that that plants are utilizing. And um, and in even lights now that will um, uh, trigger a little bit more flowering are a little bit more on the redder end. So even if you get one of those grow bulbs or anything, oftentimes they'll have a little slight, slight. You. She frozen for everybody else or just me? Summer, when you froze oh, lights. Oh, okay, you're back. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say we kind of moved on a little bit from the um, the purple and blue lights. I mean, unless you're growing like weed indoors or something along those lines, um, we've kind of moved beyond and we have like regular lights that look good in the house. But that bloom is affected more by the uh, the the red spectrum. Interesting. Yes, you're right. I don't see those colors anymore as much. And it's maybe it's not mm -hmm. to our eye. But yeah, but it's in there. there. Yeah, it's yeah, in there. it's in there. Yeah. So we have more questions coming in. I know we don't want to keep you too long. Two really interesting ones. Lisa, right now we're in the winter. So you just mentioned fertilizing your figs. Do you recommend, she's saying that what are some of the differences between winter plant care if you do live in a colder region and summer plant care? So are we yeah. fertilizing your fig in the winter? No, I mean, if you don't notice any growth on it, and again, this goes back to like, are you growing it in a greenhouse and are they still growing? Right, um, right. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know where everybody is, but um, definitely if you're in the winter, if you're in the Northeast, like I am right now, um, I'm not seeing much growth on my, my fiddle leaf fig. So I'm not going to give it any extra like little multivitamin pack or anything along those lines. But as you start to see it uh, put on new growth, and if it's start, starting to get like smaller leaves or anything like that, mm -hmm. then I, I would recommend making sure that it's not just a fertilizer with NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but that you're giving it some micronutrients because it may be an instance where uh, it, it needs more micronutrients. And, and they, need, they need fertilizer, they need those in such minute amounts. It, it's unbelievable how much I, minute amounts that they need those things in. But they need them in those minute amounts in order to be able to fulfill their life cycle. And I think we're at like 17 different nutrients, both macro and micronutrients that uh, plants need uh, to fulfill their life cycle. So if the plant is with you for a longer period of time, uh, chances are you're going to need to, to fertilize it and you're going to want to fertilize it in the growing season. And I have to say, sometimes 
plants growing seasons might actually be in the winter months. So some of our succulents, for instance, actually have put on more growth in the winter than they do in the summer. Another great example, a lot of my bulbous plants, my boa, boea volubilis, my blooming onion, is now starting to put out new growth again, and it goes dormant in the summer. It's, it's fascinating, yeah. So what are some other winter, summer watering? You cut back on your watering, perhaps, like you said. I do, I do. In the winter. And, and as a matter of fact, like the reason I feel like the reason why I could come up upstate now for a little bit longer in the winter is because my plants aren't as thirsty, which is great, you know, but in the summer months, it's going to be a challenge if I don't come up with uh, with a solution for that. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, in the winter months, I have a tendency where I am, you know, to water a lot less. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's, that's great. Or at least uh, the frequency I could, I could pull mm -hmm. back on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Lisa. I think often you hear about summer, winter, the difference in plants, but no concrete things to do. So I love yeah. that. Um, all right, well, let's take this last question from Austin about since you love on aloes, and we'll just remind you guys, we are entering you to win a copy of Summer's book, How to Make a Plant Love You. What's the subtitle? Cultivating? Um, yeah, Cultivate Green Space in Your Home and Heart. I, I don't that. even have a copy here. Otherwise, I'd hold it up and do some <laughs> my own PR. But, I can't. <laughs> um, but so you can comment with your favorite plant in the comment box what that favorite plant is to be entered to win. But Austin's question are, so tell us some of your favorite aloes right now. Mm. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I love uh, mosaic aloes. And mosaic aloes are ones that have um, usually a dark coloration with like white or colorful specklings on them. Um, so like an uh, aloe vera gata, I could think of aloe, uh, I think McDonii. Uh, there, there's a number of mosaic aloes that are really beautiful. And, uh, and you know, another medicinal aloe besides aloe vera, we always hear of aloe vera is um, aloe ferox. And you wanna make sure that those are seed grown though, because um, some of those are actually in, in, endangered where they are. And that's another thing that it's, it's important to kind of note, you know, uh, when we start to bring plants into our lives and we get interested and we want to go beyond and get into like different uh, species and people covet certain plants and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, I think it's really important to know where your sources are. And, and I, I really love supporting also small growers who have it as a hobby where they, they grow seed grown plants. And I think as we start to collect plants, Sometimes it's only the small ones that we could take home because that's what we have room for. But I think some of those are my favorite and uh, and I highlight a lot of those in my my aloe show and tell and aloe care videos. You'll be able to see an, a number of them and it'll kind of blow your mind, you know, as you start to look at the diversity of aloes. Um, one of the ones that has been growing extremely well for me too is aloe thrascii. And you know that's more of a grass aloe. So there's different types of aloes, and some of them grow more in like the mountainous regions and can uh, can handle a little light frost, for instance. And then uh, others grow in a little bit more tropical, and they can't even handle you know any type of cold temperatures. So again, when you're thinking about plants that you have near your window and it's blustery. You have to kind of uh, get a sense of like, well, what is the lowest temperature can these plants actually handle? That's another great tip since we're in the, the winter months. And, and that will vary even with aloes. So you can't really make a blanket statement with that. But a uh, fascinating plant and um, really interesting growth habits and uh, highly encourage people to look into them more and maybe you'll get uh, obsessed with aloes like I am. <laughs> well, sure. You can see people are. I love it. Um, and Homestead has, you know, when you talk about know your sources, I think that's really important. I love supporting small growers too. And you can be sure when you go to Homestead, you're getting top quality plants and they are, you know, from those, some of sometimes from those small growers. So I think yeah. it's really important to know. Yeah. Very um, good. Oh my gosh. So wonderful. We went through it almost an hour. I'm sorry I kept you so long, but so many great questions, so much great information as always. So I'm loving to ask people this year, what are you looking forward to most this year? But I think I know your answer and it has to do with flock finger legs, but you tell me, what are you most looking forward to in 2021? I am really looking forward to getting stuck into this new place. And uh, I mean, there's so much 
opportunity here. And I, I, I really see myself as a steward of land. Like, yes, we, we bought this land, but it's such a foreign concept to me. It's so hard for me to wrap my head around that. But I just feel like we're borrowing it for the time that we're here. And, it, you know, it's a little degraded. Um, it, the land is a little degraded. And that, to me, reads opportunity because I'd like to actually um, uh, really restore some of this area, keep some of this meadow so we could attract mm, yes. interesting bug life and bird life. Um, I'm not really into lawn, so I, I'm looking into actually removing the lawn and and putting in a, a lower meadow and uh, you know basically turning this into pollinator central and not just pollinators but like all bugs um, yep. because you need you need caterpillars and you need other things that um, the bird life will be attracted to. And, and so I, I, I'm really interested in getting stuck in here and doing some more agroforestry, do, doing cool things that you wouldn't necessarily always be able to do indoors, but, um, but flexing, my, flexing my muscles that way too. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, what are you looking wait. forward to? Oh my gosh. Well, seeing people being back with each other and being able to share in this plant community. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to, to that. Fingers, fingers crossed. I know. I if know. it happens in 2021, come <laughs> I on. Know. Fingers crossed. I know. That's why yeah. it's, it's not what I look forward to. So yeah. definitely, um, yeah. definitely look forward to that and being able to see you speak and see, see all of, of these great plant people. Yeah, and hopefully meet a lot of the folks here on yes. the in the chat. I mean, it, it would be really nice to meet face to face again. I I do admit I share I share with you in that that hope. Yeah, yeah. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Summer. Thank you Thank for you. your time. Thank you guys you. follow along on all her channels. We're posting them now, so um, keep keep in touch. It looks like you've got big things for being a steward of the land, and we thank you so much for that. I'm excited. And, all right. um, Thank, Thank you. you. And as I mentioned, I'll be back next Monday with Daryl Chang this time, noon, Monday, the 18th, is it, I think? So thanks Must so much, be. Summer. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye. I'm going to show you a quick little preview of those beautiful plant jungle at Homestead. So I'm just going to run through those and then we're going to end it up. But thank you so much, everybody.